<laughs> I think we did it. I love We're the countdown back. music. It's, uh, it got a little wobbly this time, which made it even better. Hey, welcome uh, to Dave and Joe, our board. Uh, we're back, and it's another Sunday. We are back. Oh, I, I, I think this is our sixth episode now. This is this is episode six. That'd We've made it. Uh, return I, of the return of the boredom. I don't know, but I will say. I think this is this after this, everything falls apart because uh, I don't think I'm I'm not even going to be in front of a computer at this time next next week, and pretty soon you're going to be wanting to do I don't know probably want to be sleeping at this hour anyway next. Uh, so yeah. now, in fairness, you have been predicting doom from day one. Yeah, I'm not saying that we're going we're going away, f uh, but I'm just saying I'm not sure when the live show is going to be next time. I might next week it might be Monday, might be Monday. Maybe. Who knows? Yeah, we'll have to figure that out. Yeah. But uh but before we get to our guest, we at least have to get uh let's 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 get a couple of our favorites done and uh Let's let's do uh, uh, let's do Adam's new food review. Let's bring him on. Everybody loves him. Uh, he's near and dear to me. Hey, Adam. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? You have your food ready. Yes. Okay. What is it going to be today? Uh, Pringles scorching cheddar. We're back to another uh, uh, fiery chip. But no uh, crinkly chip bag this time. Interesting. Interesting twist on the theme. <laughs> We're shaking it up. Hey, shake up the chips. You can... There you go. That's a whole, it's a whole different chip sound. I think we had four viewers and now we're down to two. <laughs> oh, no. Usually Adam is what, you know, brings them in. To peel the <laughs> Pringles off. I don't, I've lost all opinion or ability to care. All right. Oh, actually, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 okay, Adam. Look, it's all on you, babe. <laughs> it's, it's like barely red and barely spicy. Did all the spice fall off? I don't know. You just dump them all over your bed. By the way, nice clean bed behind. Nice, nice. I'm glad you made your bed today, buddy. Mm -hmm. It's like Pringles, but slightly spicier. It's it's so, not got a lot of spice on it. So you're basically you're saying that they're that Pringles people, by calling these scorching, are dirty, filthy liars. I mean, you just tuned sure. in. Adam has called out the Pringles Corporation. For basically uh, being filthy liars, because mm -hmm. there's nothing scorching about Pringles scorching cheddar chips. There's a small bit of scorching, but not scorching enough to be called scorching. But uh, still, on the other hand, are you gonna be? Are you gonna make it through this this can of chips? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Have you have you smelled the can? Have you sampled sampled the aroma? Smell like Pringle. Okay. All right. Thanks, Adam. Yep. We'll see you later. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adam. Wow. That is. Uh, <laughs> that's always. He re he really paints a picture. I feel like I can taste <laughs> the scorching hot Pringles myself. I'm so tired today. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was uh, actually a working title for the show, I think. <laughs> don't, I just don't care anymore. All right, Joe. Uh, let me get let me get ready. Uh, people, some people say, Joe, uh, you don't you don't get to talk to enough because I'm I'm me and I tend to you know overdo it. But we do give you your 60, 60 seconds. <laughs> So uh, uh, let's uh, let's get the timer going, and because uh, now it, it's time for uh, 
Joe Holland's Bob Dylan Minute. So uh, are you ready to, uh, are you ready, Joe? I think I'm ready. All right. And if you haven't watched the show before, uh, we give Joe, I give Joe, we, the producers, the network, gives Joe 60 seconds to talk about his hero, Bob Dylan, and how Bob Dylan has affected Joe's life in an almost, well, pretty much a religious way. Accurate. Yeah, okay. All right, Joe, and here we go, and go. Okay, so one of the questions that I get asked is, what is the, what's the best venue that I've ever uh, seen Bob Dylan perform at? I've seen 28 Bob Dylan concerts, almost uh, uh, all in different venues, very few repeats. So Bogarts in Cincinnati would be my answer to this question. I don't know if it's the best venue that I've ever seen Bob Dylan in, but it is probably the most interesting. So Bogarts is a very small little uh, venue. It's actually just kind of like a bar. Here's what it looks like when there's nobody there. That is the stage. And if you're looking from the stage, here is the bar. And then when there's people in a concert, it's packed full. Uh, they say that it uh, it seats, or when there's no seats, it, it holds 1,500 people. I, I don't know. It doesn't seem to me like it could possibly be that many people. But anyway, so this was very exciting. He uh, This was when he was touring with Paul Simon. But uh, Oh, he, sorry, Joe. I'm sorry, Joe. But uh, that's the, that's your 60 seconds. The, the minute goes fast. The minute goes yeah, fast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I'd love to really... I'd love to hear about Bob Dylan and Paul Simon, but it's been 60 seconds, so. Maybe there'll be a part two. Oh, what the heck? What happened with Bob Dylan and Paul Simon? Okay, well, you're going to be disappointed in this because I never saw him with Paul Simon. Oh, uh, no. This was actually, so he scheduled these uh, concerts with Paul Simon in the area, and then this was kind of a surprise little extra side concert that he announced just like, right before the tickets went on sale. Uh, so this was just a solo Bob Dylan performance while he was uh, touring with Paul Simon. So I never saw him with Paul Simon. Wow. Okay. Well, thanks, Joe. That was the Bob Dylan Minute. Hey, I just want... Uh, uh, this This made me think of... Because I lived in Cincinnati for uh, uh, like two years. And I was like, ah, I think I've been to Bogarts. I, uh, I, saw, I saw the Bare Naked Ladies back when they were uh, cool in 1995. Wow. And then I returned to Bogarts in 1998 for the Brian Setzer Orchestra. And that is the last time I was at Bogarts, 1998. There you go. All right, well, let's, let's, uh, let's just get to it. Let's get to our guest. I, 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 I want to talk a little bit about our, our guest before we bring him on tonight. Uh, our guest tonight is Shane Cluster. I think that's his name. Is that his name? I mean, I, I, I assume that's his name. That's what they say in the books that he, that he works on. Uh, you know, it could be something else. I don't know Shane that well. This is, this is our first guest that uh, I've never really talked to in person until now. I've only kind of kept in contact with them through through messages. And I have to say, uh, I don't know why he, he agreed to do this because, I mean, messaging with me, I don't know. I, I think I come across as some disgruntled, raving lunatic. And uh, I'm surprised that I haven't just like, like he's not, oh, this Aikens guy keeps keeps contacting me. Yeah. But he's here, so I don't know. But uh, but I am a big fan of his work. He, he he's younger than me, so uh, I'm horribly jealous of his work because he's doing all these fun uh, little golden books for Random House uh, with Star Wars and uh, Marvel and uh, and I love Nickelodeon to death. But uh, ooh, wouldn't that be fun to to do Star Wars once? Nah, yeah, I cartoon dogs. That's that's my life. Cartoon dogs. So anyway, let's bring on Shane Cluster and because uh, uh, what more can we say? Shane, hello. Hi. Hi, Shane. Hello again. All right, bye, Shane. We'll see you Goodbye. later. All right. So that was Shane. Oh, come on. 
Let's keep saying that. Wait, 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 I didn't even give you the applause. There we go. That's how tired I am. Shane, uh, now, okay, before I started harassing you uh, through Instagram messages, uh, you have to admit, you have no clue who the hell I am, correct? No, I, I remember it very differently. I remember I did know who you were, and I remember it that I spoke to you first. And ah, I got you to send me weird. some Playmobil figures. That's how I remember our relationship. But <clears throat> I also don't remember you being that much older than me, but here we are. So, well, well, that's the thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I, I just know uh, from, I guess I, I kind of view it as when you, your bio or when you claim that you started doing uh, oh, commercial yeah. art. Well, that's because I had, um, you know, a whole life before you met me, Dave. Well, there you go. <laughs> it was, I've worked a lot of other jobs and so. Well, that's, uh, but you, you, the ball started rolling in 2005? Yes. The art, the art ball. Yeah, the, the last time I had a real job was 05. Is that when full-time freelancing kicked in? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pop response. Yeah. <laughs> For all of us that do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well let's take a quick look at uh at a, at a bunch of your work as we chat here because oh man it's so darn good thank you. uh and this is one of my favorites and and this i think was one of the first books i might have seen you do that i went oh hey that's pretty cool what year did this one come out do you remember i want to say 17 18 so it's pretty new in our heads it's pretty new but in the publishing world you know it's a while yeah. ago yeah well that's the thing that happened with like in between 05 and this so that was another 10 years where i was doing a lot of random jobs i was doing a lot of comics that weren't really like you know your big two three and uh and then then this year was when things kicked into the next gear to where not only was i not doing a real job but I could survive off of this one, you know. And was was this uh, this was not the first licensed character job? The Grinch and some other things came before this, right? I, I like all the same year, all the same year. Yeah, now, I, think, I think the Grinch did, and I did Top Wing and and the Avengers. So, what uh, for you? What got? How did the publishers connect the dots and bring you into the licensing world? Now, I know that a lot of what you do doesn't necessarily have to be 100% on model. For instance, you know, this Spider-Man isn't based on anything right. but your, you know, your technique. And But how did you, how did you get into licensing? Was it through uh, your, an agency or? You know, it was, um, it was largely through fan art. You know, and I know a lot of people online, there's like a discourse between what is the fan art is good and then fan art is bad. And I was just doing fan art well, outside of work. And then I reached out. Was to this was this one uh, one of your like kind of earlier portfolio font pieces that was basically done as a sample for yourself? This was actually after I was working on them. Okay. But yeah, it's the same, it's the same thing because, you know, the style is different than what I was doing for Golden Books. Yeah, because this is more the Disney. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Disney big. Film. But you know, the funny thing is, you call it fan art, and that's kind of a newer term for what we used to just call a uh, portfolio piece. Yeah. You know, anytime you do a piece that wasn't for a job, uh, you would call it uh, just a portfolio sample. You know, and and it would be done to try to get work. And and you would do them to, you know, in hopes that it would lead to, you know, uh, work yeah. in that similar vein. Because art directors can be that literal minded that, you know, yeah, yeah. if 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 you want a job drawing Indiana Jones, 
showing pictures of an actor isn't enough. Sometimes they're that literal minded that they want to see an artist who has already drawn Indiana Jones. Right. So, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know what people are expecting. They're down on fan art. I guess if you are not being paid, you shouldn't be drawing it to their mind. I don't know what. But. I, don't, I, I think sometimes the problem with fan art is that uh, there's there's a, a lack of aspiration uh, from the artists into making it a portfolio piece to pursue le actual published work. Sometimes it's just they just don't I don't know if they have enough confidence to think that it's worthy of, you know, pursuing work or, or not. Other times I think they get caught up in the convention circuit which is to just go and sell prints of fan art. And that's their job that they aspire to. It's a weird, I don't know. It's a weird yeah, mind. There's definitely people that look down on the fan art like that it's less of quality, but if you're doing it for yourself, if it's fan art, then who cares what, you know, if you're, if you're having fun and doing it, then who cares, right? And again, but, I, I mean, I like we said, the other name for it is a portfolio piece. If you're doing a portfolio piece, it's a portfolio piece. You know, so there you go. I, how else are you going to, like I said, how else are you going to get those jobs if you don't have the samples to show to, to try out for those jobs? So one person's fan art is another person's portfolio tryout for a legit, for an actual job. Right. Maybe they're afraid to actually say that. Maybe they're afraid to do a, you know, Marvel piece and be like, I really hope Marvel sees this, especially like out in social media. You don't want people being like attacking well, think, you or criticizing you or something. Yeah. And I think sometimes in the world of comics, the problem there is, is that a lot of uh, people doing fan art don't want to do the, uh, the full portfolio for, for getting Marvel work and, and, you know, which requires more than just pinups and things. Um, and we're showing a lot of covers. I, I, I've got, well, I'm going to get to a little bit that had some of your interior and some of your stuff, but um, I just want to run through. I'm, I'm kind of showing a little bit more of your little golden book stuff and your license stuff just because we're kind of nerds here. But you do have a body of work that was children's books that were not, you know, based on licensed characters or other series that weren't, you know, tied into uh, uh, to licenses. Um well, this is the this is the bread and butter, though. Really, I mean, potatoes. We got a lot of fun here in Marvel Land, uh, and here's some of your a little bit more of your interior stuff. Uh, and now, Vince, uh, we were, we were going to ask you here: How does Shane draw a pen and paper on the computer? Well, I can tell you, Vince, uh, just from the start, the world of pen and paper for us is. Uh, is no longer a uh, a reality. I don't. I, what was the last? When was the last time uh, for Shane that pen and paper was part of the process for uh, for like Random House for for a published book? Oh, easily ten years ago, probably over ten years ago. And for me, I switched over officially when I bought my Cintiq in I think two thousand ten. So so that little. Thing right there because it was so expensive i had to learn to accept it and there was no going back because it was over two thousand dollars <laughs> i actually switched i went digital now you mentioned it i was using this in tea and then i went to paper just because i was so sick of sitting you know at a desk stuck you know i was single and you know i was sitting at that cintiq all day and i started to print out my blue lines on paper and go to a coffee shop and draw them with actual pens and then now I'm back to digital, but I'm working on an iPad so I could still go out. That's cool. I haven't, I, you know, I, I just kind of take being down here as work time. Uh, and, and, you know, that's it. That's, that's, if I'm down here, I'm working, I don't want to bring it upstairs. So I, I haven't gotten into the, uh, the, you know, an iPad or, or being more mobile. Um, but speaking of which with these books, uh, your digital, but what's your favorite? What's your main program for these? Procreate. I've been using Procreate probably ten years too. It's been a long time. Oh, really? All the color work, everything is Procreate. Yeah, and every year I'm able to do more and more. Like 
So when I first started, I could only do roughs and then I would have to print them out. Right. And then I was able to do, you know, like six layers or something. And then I would have to, then when I could go on to color, so I would do like grayscale comics. And then when I went to full color, I would have to like save a background file that was layered and then merge that and then do another file. So I would have 10 files for everything. So you really, really did not want to succumb to right, yeah. our, no. our, our overlords Adobe. You yeah. just were like, I know I will not be a slave to Adobe. Yeah, That's yeah exactly. A, I, boy, I just don't know if, if uh, I tell you, I, uh, on the other hand, uh, I got to CS5 with Adobe and and I and I froze myself in time, which I'm in trouble because now I'm 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 in trouble uh, because you know when I get a new computer, CS CS five ain't gonna work on it anymore. Right, that's but, what I have for converting to uh, CMYK. <clears throat> so I I I am in desperate need of an entire studio redo. Everything for me now is probably 12 years old and don't like updating because uh, you know if it works it works leave me alone and so now i have to uh i, I think i'm i'm in trouble <laughs> yeah, but over over on this side which thankfully no one can see is my uh old mac tower which i use uh, freehand five to do line work vector line work for uh for all my you know for all the books that need line work and that's uh you know, not only is that an old program, but it's an old discontinued program <laughs> from like what two thousand and three. <laughs> and I love the idea of working on a twenty-year-old program that's like being in the year two thousand and working on a program from nineteen eighty. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Oh, it's a lovely crutch to have. Oh man, this stuff is beautiful. There's some nice stuff, some more Marvel. You jerk. Uh that oh, I like the the that what there. Yeah. All right, and of course, you weren't content enough with Marvel. You had to go into Star Wars land. Now, the one thing I liked about uh, I noticed another website had asked you for these, but I really liked seeing these. So, uh this is a little bit of your process now. I'm used to three stages. I'm used to roughs, tights, and then color art. When you're doing books like this, how many stages are you doing? Uh, <clears throat> two. I do the roughs and the color. All right. So, so they they let you then. So you don't really need want feel the need to show them anything quicker to kind of just I be will. like. I will sometimes for like the cover, if I'm trying to do something, you know, that I think uh, may not be well received, I'll do like a super loose thumbnail. Okay. But at this stage, I don't. And then I'll send this in and they'll be like, hey, it's good to go. Uh, sometimes, not these people, but. Well, you can see like this one. I mean, you can see just from going back and forth here. The nice thing is, is that, and because this is digital, this kind of shows people that just because they say to you, okay, we like, but we don't like. Your drawings are still right. Yeah, yeah edited. Yeah, but to that, back to that other page, like you were saying, how you have three stages. Sometimes I'll turn this in, and they'll be like, "All right, that's good to go. Clean it up." And I'm like, "What? What would you like for me to do with it?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, this one, I imagine that they yelled at you for having everybody in the gutter. Well, no. Uh, I mean, I still, I still did it okay with the gutter. They didn't want Darth Maul. Yeah, she fights Darth Maul like a hundred times in the in the series, and it's scary. Yeah. I, oh, that could. That's probably it. Yeah. But uh, and this is another. I mean, this is another neat one. So, is this in your head? Do you view these drawings as kind of like a, um, a, a, a kind of an in between a rough and a tight? Is this kind of like a rough tight to you, or is this in your head? Is this a tight? I'm not gonna get any tighter. <laughs> okay, so, so I, call them, I call them roughs, but if you ask me to clean it up and I'm still doing color, like if I was to do line art, then there would be a stage 
where I can make the lines cleaner. Yeah. But at this point, there's nothing for me to do before final art. Yeah. In my head, anyway, it's never come up. So that's awesome. That's well, I found the advantage of doing it all yourself, I guess. Right. Oh, heck yeah. yeah. When we do it all ourselves. Yeah. We're working, we're working for, we're working for our own needs. And then we're also working for whatever the client needs to see or random house or Lucas or Disney needs to see. But ultimately the goal is to get the publisher on board with whatever we need to proceed. Like, like we don't want to waste time doing more than what we need to go to the next level. Yeah. Sure. You feel the same Shane? Yeah. I mean, I, I look at it all the time that I have, that I'm in publishing, that I'm not an artist <clears throat> or even maybe even an illustrator, but in terms of like, you know, and, and I try to cut out as much as I can in terms of the steps, in terms of how long it's going to be out for review in terms of how long it's going to take me to get it done. And, you know, time is money and, and the publishing industry works that way. So, you know, you know, they want to turn them out. I want to turn them out. Yep. You know, let's get it done. Yeah. But and, and, speaking and, of that to something you were saying about doing it all to yourself and full disclosure for a lot of these, for a lot of years, I had a guy <clears throat> named Nathan Brown, Brown that was doing my flats. So he would go in and do like, you know, the, the red of her hair or whatever. And then I would render it after I, had, I would draw it, send it to him. He would put in flat solids and then send it back to me. And then I would render it. And so we had, you know, there was like a little machine inside the big machine. And it was just, you know, just cranking. Yeah, I've never, uh, I, 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 there was a brief time where I wanted, I thought maybe I could be a studio because I worked at a studio. And I thought maybe that I could work with other people. And uh, I do not work well with other people. I, I expect too much, and when it falls apart, I, I get so irritable, and uh, so I, I just have to do everything myself. And so what that does to me is, is that it makes the efficiency part of it that you talked about the most interesting thing sometimes about the entire process, because it's, it's more for me like being a... Uh, uh, marathon runner and thinking well how can i how can i beat my time mm -hmm. what what can i do for the process so for instance with coloring books i got to the point where i said okay you want roughs you want tights you want final line art that's three stages and you're driving me nuts so i'm just going to go from roughs to final line art and make whatever changes and roll the dice that they're not going to be that many changes you know and, and just find whatever stages that i can do to get away with to, to cut out of the process to just speed it up but yeah, uh, that's weird because that initial stage i never i never get feedback that's so large that i needed like a really rough thumbnail where they're like change the pose entirely i mean almost never it's always some kind of minute detail that would have been in the next stage anyway well and sure and you look at something like this and you can see a lot of changes made but they're made to the design and to the layout. They're not made to the drawings necessarily. Right, yeah. So when a client tells you to do that, we don't get upset because, oh, look, the drawing of Luke and, and or of uh, uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin is still is still done. And the drawing of Anakin and, and Ahsoka is, is pretty much still done. So it's not like you're saying, ah, back to the drawing board. You're just right. You're uh, just reconfiguring stuff. Yeah, I mean, his face is completely different. But again, you wouldn't have read his face in the in a really rough thumbnail anyway. So, yeah, and that's a, not a not a big uh, ordeal uh, to have right, to do. Right, it's still I not think, time consuming. Yeah, I think that the three stage effect that I've always had to deal with is 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 a lot of times a request of Nickelodeon. So that is a very specific licensor um request that that's the way they like to work and so there you go you know there's nothing you can do about it so you know if i had it, a job last year where they asked me for roughs and i sent in roughs 
and then there then some time passed and i just assumed they were you know reviewing them and they're like so when are you gonna ink these and i'm like when you approve the roughs they're like oh well we call inks here roughs <laughs> so they wanted, like, <laughs> final line work to review and i was just like how am i supposed to know that yeah. first of all and then why would i do that and then have you make changes and notes to something i have to re-ink the entire thing it was just no nope no. Well, I can beat that. I had a uh, was working with Nickelodeon for uh, an educational publisher, and they found that the um, color stage was uh, was not final art. That they needed to market research the color art, get feedback, and then make revisions after that, and and. And they thought that that all was included in the budget, which was already low. Right, right. And it was this most, it was the most mortifying, you know, uh, kind of amusing, get me out of here, you know, where you're like, yeah, no, no, that, that costs more. And they were like, oh, okay. And then in your head and you're like, and we're not doing this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, that's why, you know, that's part of why I'm so happy to, be doing all the golden books aside from just the like they're good licenses and properties but like you're saying but like they're good people to work for oh they are you know, they're reasonable and they pay promptly and they pay reasonably and everything about it is just a good gig so yes the the folks at random house uh are wonderful we all i think from from a, a good uh, a good sane artist to a good sane designer our goal is to go home or be done and just get it done and not make drama and not make anyone, you know, have to do any more work than necessary. Um, and, and everybody seems to be lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And I always say that the weirdest thing I've noticed, and this has nothing to do with me, but the, the, over the past, you know, 20 plus years of doing with publishers, like, or I don't know, Random House, I think I've been working for 12 years. The very few times where I've seen somebody maybe fumble things, uh, surprisingly enough, they, they didn't stick around long at Random House. Yeah, that's not surprising. So, so I guess my experience was not an isolated, you know, an isolated thing. But I will say the other thing, though, aside from just having to to do the job and not make it more complicated is like there has to be a certain level of trust there between the licensors and the art directors and then down from the art directors editors down to the artists right like you can't just be put on a property that they don't have trust in you handling it well or, or knowing what you're doing or yeah. doing the research or you know that kind of thing. So that goes back to the original thing like we were talking about with fan art. It's like, they go, oh, this is a person that likes these things and knows some things about these. Maybe the, the editor and the art director doesn't even know that much about it. And they trust that you're gonna help them out and not make huge mistakes for the company and embarrass them if it makes it to press or embarrass them in front of the licensor because you made clone troopers the wrong color or something, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, Sometimes I, I get the feeling that, you know, because I tend to work with uh, more of the preschool licenses that were, no one is a fan of, because why would you be? You're a grown oh, person. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's different than we're looking at Sesame Street here, which we've all grown in. But every time we get that I work on a new show, starting with Dora and, and going into, you know, whatever Nick Jr. has, um, you know, I can maybe personally find something to be kind of adorable and cute. But, you know, I, I'm not a fan because I'm a middle-aged dude. So, you know, it, it's, it, 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 you're removed from it. I had this conversation with my daughter just two days ago. She was asking me, like, why do you like Elmo? And I was like, well, you know, I'm not sitting around watching it for myself, but I can appreciate it. Sure. I can, I can appreciate what it means to other people. Exactly. I, I can like the significance of it and the import of it that maybe I'm not necessarily a fan of it. And I tell you, that's one of the benefits that I found from doing occasional convention appearances is that, uh, especially when your kids get 
older and and leave the world of the these preschool uh, licenses is that you get to uh, <laughs> get to hear uh, uh, the sound of email coming in. Um, you get to to meet kids and you get to meet the parents who have the kids that are big fans of these shows, and it kind of helps to uh, to get a feel of what everybody thinks about them. But uh, yeah, yeah. it's fun too about like you know my kids were growing out of it, especially my daughter that I would read a lot of these golden books to. She's grown out of it, but then other people have have had that same relationship with their kids that I have with my kids, but now it's with books that I've drawn. And so it's still kind of like ties together. And it's kind of like for me personally, maintaining that relationship longer than maybe it ran its natural course. Yeah. And, and honestly, you know, I I see some um, bless their hearts. I see, you know, a lot of children's bookstores and things, or when you see the world of children's books and, and it's more, uh, licensed books almost gets gets viewed as lowbrow, and thankfully the little golden books get viewed as kind of still cool. Yeah. But unfortunately, a lot of what I do gets viewed as kind of very disposable and lowbrow, and uh, so it is kind of uh, I don't know. It's kind of easy to get a little bit of an inferiority complex about things, but at the same time, when you meet parents and you meet kids, and you're still getting them to read, and you know, I'm sorry. It's not a it's not a hardcover, pretty painted book about feelings. But uh, you know, if they're reading SpongeBob, uh, you know, an eight by eight SpongeBob or a step in the learning, you know, SpongeBob five dollar paperback book, they're reading. So and the shelf life of your stuff lasts longer too. And a lot of these, I see a lot of these like important children's books, you know, and they're and the publisher is pushing them, and there's a lot of prestige behind the creative team and you know, and then three months later, no one ever talks about it. People are still talking about the stuff you're working on or you have worked on, you know, 10 oh. years later. We have books of yours that my kids discovered that I see your name on, like this freaking guy again. But, you know, <laughs> it was from a long time ago, you know. Well, and that's the thing is that is that in order to do the books that I do, and, and I think even the golden books too, they are mass produced in numbers. The goal is in the hundreds of thousands if not more, I mean, I've got a little golden book, my Dora little golden book, which I actually got booted off of by Nick because they didn't like my character designs. But my first book is still in print 12 years later. Yeah. So, you know, take that. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I love about little golden books that's different than the paperbacks because rarely do those keep in print that long. But the little golden books... If, if they keep the license and the sales keep going, then, you know, you can be in, in, in 23rd or 30th printing or, you know, or you go back to there's a monster at the end of this book or some of their right, books right, that yeah. are classics that as long as they still have that license, man, that book is going to be in print, you know, for it's it's a perennial, you know, I've got six golden books that are out of print already. That's a big hit for my uh, my whole What's it called? The Ovoir. Oh, it's tough. And and I tell you, when they're based on these licenses that come and go, um, like, you know, because I started I started with Little Golden Books. So for me, uh, when I started in 2002 with Simon & Schuster, that ran until about 2010-ish, I think. And they started to, their, their sales and their uh, energy with Nick and things started to kind of peter. And so Random House swooped in and, and they didn't have the full license yet. They had coloring books and then they had little golden books. So they put me on little golden books and coloring books. And so I did that and it was Dinosaur Train and the Cat in the Hat Knows All, you know, whatever that show was and then some Nickelodeon stuff. And so, yeah, those are all licenses that kind of came and went. Uh, Dora, the one Dora book being the one that became a, uh, a constant in print, which is pretty fun. Um, and then they got the full random house, got the full license to do everything. And then they said, Hey, Dave, we need you over an on model land. We can find off model funky artists there. You know, we, we can get Shane to do or, you know, we can get, <laughs> there's better, there's better. We can find better of those. 
And, uh, and it was kind of hard to argue with him. It was like, yeah, yeah, I'll go back to my, I'll go back to doing what I do. And I think a lot of that is because a lot of people don't want to necessarily do what I do. Uh, it's not as much fun, but it's, but it's not difficult. You know, it, it, it's, you know, I'm, it's, that's not a complaint. It's just not as the, the golden books give you a little bit of personality. They're looking for, for most of them, a little bit of the artist's individual personality to shine through. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes there's, there's plenty of them where they, they're not anymore. Oh, and some, some they've been hiring artists to just do flat out recreations of, of animation stills. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but I think for when, especially 12 years ago with Nickelodeon, they really wanted them to be off model and funky. Um, and of course the, the landscape has changed so much over 12 years where they've gone in and found He-Man. I, I totally even forgot to add all your He-Man uh, pictures on here because you did those three books. Uh -huh. those, are, those are some of the ones that are gone now. Oh. And so I was just talking to my buddy, Nate Lovett is doing some Dungeons and Dragons ones where I think part of the introduction of those was him trying to pitch uh, character designs in order to get the job. Have you had, do, do you do any hoop jumping or any pitch work before getting the job? Or have you done it long enough now where they just say, all right, yeah. Shane, here you go. I mean, sometimes it's not me. Sometimes it's the, um, like Random House will want me and then they have to prove to the licensor. Yeah. So we have, we have collective uh, hoop to jump through. And I'm in one of those right now with a, with a license yeah. right now minute like waiting to hear back like do i do i get this job <laughs> right yeah, yeah yeah so you know there's always there's always that and then then it's smooth sailing and but then it can change you know so like i had to apply to get into the star wars lgbs right i had to do some stuff and i had some stuff and there's that process of being like you know we like this guy we let him do it and you know, and that went on and I finally got in and then I got like two, three books and I was like, hey, I'm the Star Wars guy. And then immediately they they switched directions three times since then. Like the three books after my three have all been different by different teams, different people and different directions. And, yep. you know, and so. Yeah, I mean, it's something we get used to, but I mean, that's that's no different when Nickelodeon had me doing Dora. And then all of a sudden I got a book that was a group book. And they said, oh, and by the way, it was like the second oversized little golden book that had multiple Nick characters. And this one, they said, oh, yeah, don't do your Dora. You know, we want this Mary Blair, even more, Mary, you know, a different little golden book Dora. So, you know, and it was just kind of like, OK, I mean, you know, and sometimes I, we get a little it's almost like we get a little like, well, if you wanted something different, you just could have said so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'm surprised that um, some it's one of two things. Like I'm not entirely sure, or maybe three things, but like I'm not entirely sure because I'm not there in the room. But I think sometimes they assume like I don't want to do it, or I'm not good enough to do that. It's not what I do, or um, I'm already too busy to do doing other things. Yeah. Well, so that, I mean, that's that's, that's when they don't even ask. That's but. a kryptonite for all of us is, is the whole, uh, uh, oh, I just assumed you were busy. And you're just like, ah, oh, geez, <laughs> let me tell you. I'm <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm busy today, but it's going to take us three, four months to get this rolling. Like, yeah. I won't be busy then. Yeah. Or or even worse, where they say, oh, but you're, you're doing a book for so-and-so. So you're already busy. And it's like. I can do more than one book. <laughs> yeah. I've been lucky with, with the random house people where I, I feel like they, they trust me to do a couple at least. You know, there, there's a there's a point where they're like, no, you're overextended. But Oh yeah, and, and you learn and you learn to not do that, but uh you know, you, you learn to not get too greedy. Uh you know, when the, when the kids haven't seen you, and, and for me, I mean, when the arm gives out, and, you know, and I'm like, ah, what did I do to the drawing arm? Yeah. 
I don't push through that, man. I push through that every time. The one well, time I tell you, I tell you, uh, I found that sadly, uh, I push through it, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not in trouble, but yeah, I've hit the age where my body said, "Hey, guess what? Remember when you thought you could push through that?" Yeah, yeah. No, I know that day is coming. That's why I'm trying to. So I tell you, up now. enjoy it. And hopefully it will never happen. But when it does go, oh, that's what Dave was telling me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Well, hey, uh, I shoot, man. I could probably shoot the baloney with you about this for uh, for way too long. But, boy, uh, big fan of what you do. We haven't even talked about how much we hate Alan Batson. <laughs> we'll have to do a whole episode. I'll come back for uh, I hate Alan Batson episode. <laughs> I tell you, we're going to figure out when that British jerk is available to join us. Yeah. And, uh, and, and if uh, just for context for anybody that's watching, Alan is a, a fantastic illustrator, does a lot of little golden books, and uh, he's over in England. He's, and we, we just don't like him at all. He's too good. It keeps getting better. That's what's He keeps getting part. better, and he's very, very nice, at least online. You know, he's very, very, very nice. And it just makes it worse. <laughs> so yeah, I think look forward to that on a on a new episode. Joe, I'll send you his books, or I'll make sure you can order some of Alan's books, uh, and and you can join in. Uh, he did Peter Porker Spider Ham. Ooh, I'm a fan. Yep, yep. That's a that's a beautiful. Oh my gosh. I remember studying his work before I was trying to because I was doing like pen and ink comic stuff. And then he was one of the people I would study when I was trying to transition into children's books. And I remember studying his um, Beauty and the Beast, but it was called like, I'm the Beast or something like that. And, uh, you know, and it was so good. And then I actually made it in and I'm like, oh, we're, we're like peers now. I'm like peers with that guy. And then he still, he just shot right past me again. So what I do, uh, and this kind of started with... Um, when I agreed to do some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stuff with Simon and Schuster, I don't know, 15 plus years ago, I looked at what was being published and I found uh, some stuff that was too good. And then I found some stuff that was horrible. And, and, and the horrible stuff is just as important as the too good of stuff. Because if you look at stuff that's too good, it's, it's, it's inspirational, but it's intimidating. Mm -hmm. But if you find stuff that is just that you think is just awful, it says to you, I can do this. Like they they hired this person. They printed this. I can do this. I can at least be in the middle. And which is which is not what you want to aspire to. But it takes the anxiety off. Yeah. And so when I got my first little golden book, that's what I did. I said, oh, my God, I'm freaking out here. Little golden book is this is huge. And I went and I looked at some and I found some that I thought were just awful that were like Disney one, like, like that were legit licensed ones that should have been freaking incredible. And, and, and to me, they were terrible and, and it helped me just take a deep breath and calm the heck down and say, you know, Disney printed this, this was a big deal. This was, you know, this was not a, Mm -hmm. uh, a no name book and uh you know all these and they they weren't that great you can you can at least be in this part <laughs> you can yeah. at least be over here and then so you know i did that for like many years as a young man with comics and i would think like oh i could do this and i have not drawn one you know marvel dc comic not one time in my career you know, and I just think I didn't understand like the demands of the industry, right? I didn't understand the demands of the job, but I didn't understand that their portfolio pieces were up here and they're cranking it out every day was down here. And I would see this and be like, oh, I could do that. And I would spend a week on a page trying to do that. And so I try to I try to shoot for the top, assuming I'm going to fall short. And then I end up in the middle. Well, I think I think, like I said, I th the point of it all for me was to just get over uh, the anxiety that slows you down. Get over that by looking at the stuff that says, "Oh no, 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 you're better than this," and they, they and this got printed. 
And then that allows you to then focus on the stuff that is inspirational and soak that in. So you look over here to say to see what not to do, but also to say, it's going to be okay, you're fine. You know, oh, yeah. and that, that calms you down, that lets you get to work. And then that lets you focus on the other pile that says, okay, well, let's do whatever we can to to make sure that we're in this pile and not in this pile and uh and you know and get over maybe yeah, when you look at those nowadays i mean now in hindsight i'm sure you know having worked in history you know like you don't know the backstory behind those yeah. not great books they might have been done in yeah. two weeks they might have been a quick turnaround no yeah. you know and it's not an insult of the time. artist it doesn't have to be saying you don't have right. to say that artist right. is terrible yeah. it just says that this got printed, this was viewed as acceptable at some point. This made it to press. Yeah. So, and that goes with comics too. And that's why, you know, we're, Joe and I are big giant comic nerds. And, you know, sadly, there's a whole level of professional artists that became the, um, the artists that would bail out people, you know, over a weekend. But the problem is that those jobs wouldn't look that great. How could they? And so they got that reputation for looking kind of mediocre, but not their fault. They kept being the bailout artists. So, you know, it almost like was that point of like, oh, don't take the bailout jobs. You'll actually end up shooting yourself and doing more damage, you know, to your career. But yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's let's do a little bit here of uh, since we got a couple little extra little bits here let's see because adam's been watching let's give adam at least a little bit of return because he's he, he are you gonna join us shane are you gonna stay with us yeah i'll stick around all right adam hello good to see you. adam you like you remember a lot of little golden books right uh, yes i think but i don't think we i think you're too old for for i have shane's uh uh mandalorian book but Tonight before bed, should we read this? <laughs> but that had to be a big seller. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, actually, I mean, shoot, the one I've got is, uh, I think, the seventh printing. Really? Wow. Yeah. So right I there, you get residuals at seven. So that's. That's oh you, no, you don't. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't. We do not get it for anyone listening. We do not get any more money. <laughs> we sign away everything. We take the we get the we get the first payment, you know, the money, and then they no, Yeah, like I said, that Dora book is on 12 years now, and no, I don't get any. <laughs> or we can read the threat of Thanos. That's uh that's another uh I like it when little little kids' books deal with the uh extinction of half the universe. Well, that's comic version, so it didn't. Oh. It didn't do that. Oh man! Well, Adam, we're gonna we're gonna do a little. We're, we're I mean, we're kind of doing a little of Adam watched a movie, but uh, but you really didn't watch a movie, did you? No, no. But at some point, we 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 have watched Chopping Mall, right? Yeah. And, and do you remember Chopping Mall? No. <laughs> it was it was the teenagers that thought it would be cool to spend the evening in the mall after it closed. Yeah. And the mall had security robots, but what happened? They 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 did stuff. <laughs> they got all they got all murdery. Yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So, this kind of ties in you you had some uh you had some free time uh-huh and you like you like making stuff yep and so uh what are we what are we calling uh this 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 robot that you made i don't know we call it like knife bot 3000 sure all right well let's take a look at uh at your creation the, the first version of your creation here in all its glory if it uh if the stream bots gods shine on us all righty. Are they going to shine on us? Oh, there it is. Ah. Oh. So that's the, that's your that's the beauty of KnifeBot, right? Yep. What were you thinking? Uh 
knife stabs. Yeah. 360. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, controlled by your phone? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. That's uh, that's interesting. Now, my comment was that I felt that it needed to be uh, kind of kind of a little more chopping mall involved, right? Mm -hmm. So that led to uh, that led to KnifeBot four thousand, which uh, which is on the move. That's so terrifying. <laughs> well, the extension cord runs out. And uh, if Holly likes to say it's an accident waiting to happen, every child will want one for Christmas. So yeah, it'll be a big seller. Amazon bestseller. You know what? Let's watch that again. Oh man. Now, Adam, we haven't officially you haven't officially made this cordless, have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be that'd be like fifty dollars more, and I don't want to do that. Oh. Well, Adam, I mean, I'm proud of you. I salute you and your technological achievement. Uh, now, technically, I mean, you have seen uh, uh, Chopping Mall, so we have to ask, and Shane, we do this every time that Adam's reviewed a movie. Uh, Joe, have you seen Chopping Mall? I have not seen Oh! <laughs> Man, we're still, we're still, uh, we're still on a... Shane, Joe has never seen any of the movies. Okay. That's going to ask. Is We're six, like ep six episodes in, in, and I have not seen any of them yet. By the way, I do want to say, uh, I did not realize, it, our Joe has Joe seen it graphic, has Zootopia in it, which uh, we were talking last week with our buddy Ben Lane, worked on Zootopia. That's a weird, that's a weird coincidence. dink. Well, Adam, thank you so much for sharing KnifeBot with us and uh, the nightmares that I hope uh, viewers uh, get to get from that. Now, uh, as Christmas comes along, uh, you gonna you, are, are you gonna offer it up as a uh, mass production for for Christmas time? It, I I'm the only one that can have it. It's <laughs> it's that valuable. He's one of art. one. He's an artiste. Yeah. All right. Well, good to see you, Adam. Thanks so much for sharing with us. Thanks, Adam. Yep. All right, Daddy. Oh, boy, that's that kid of mine. All right. Okay. Now, since we prepped stuff, Shane, what we like to one of the things we also like to do every week is that Joe and I pick a, a comic to talk about. And I think you might like at least my pick this week because it's something near and dear to me. But because supposedly I have to let Joe talk, let's uh, let's start with <laughs> Joe and our uh, Dave and Joe pick of the week. Joe, take it away. All right. My comic this week is the classic Iron Man issue 228 from 1987. So this would be uh, from right around the time I first started collecting comic books. And so this was my exposure to Iron, uh, Iron Man was the Silver Centurion armor. Uh, and you can see Captain America there. But oh, no, no, no. That's not Captain America. That is the Captain so that's during that's during the uh, classic uh, storyline where Captain America was replaced, and uh, then he was masquerading as the Captain. And that storyline proved that the suit does not make the man. <laughs> right? Oh, that's and this before or after USA. I'm sorry. Is this before or after USA? I, I can't hear over the applause. Well, I hear the clapping noise. U.S. Agent. Did this lead to U.S. Agent? It, or did it, yeah, it led to U.S. Agent. Right. Yeah. After uh, Steve Rogers returned to being Captain America, then U.S. Agent started wearing the Captain costume. So anyway, uh, then I this is a picture <laughs> from inside the comic. I just thought, you know, this this shows that the modern the movie audience doesn't know what they're missing. <laughs> when it comes to Tony Stark, this is Tony Stark as he was meant to be in the eighties with the most amazing mullet you could possibly have. It's a gorgeous so, thing. Man. So the, the movies really need to, I think, step it up and work on the casting or the, you know, whatever the costume design and figure out Robert Downey Jr. With a mullet. So uh, not necessarily. Um, well, I, I, yeah, I guess inspired by, 
by that comic. This is a commission that is in my collection, which uh, I had the uh, the artist of this issue, uh, Mark Bright, did this for me, depicting this. You know, it's kind of a take on the cover uh, battle between the Silver Centurion Iron Man and Steve Rogers as the captain. And, oh, and this- I just want to say, we got to hang with Mark at Cincinnati a couple of yes. years ago. Uh, he is a super cool dude, as well as being an awesome artist. But man, he was a lot of fun to uh, to get to know. Yes. Uh, I love that commission. I think he did. Well, how old is he awesome by, by now? I grew up on his work on G.I. Joe, and then he was doing Quantum and Woody when I was an uh, adult. He's got to be 80 years old. No, Mark I thought was maybe in his 60s. I don't know. I don't want to, you know, I... I, I Probably in that generation. Yeah, this is 35 years ago. So, yeah, I would think 60 50s, early 60s, maybe. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, I love that commission. And then this is just another, this is another uh, piece Ron. I have. Ron. Ron, <laughs> Ron Friends. We try to Ron. mention, we try to mention Ron Friends just about every uh, episode. This is one of the first uh, comic art commissions that I ever got through the mail. When I figured out that that was a thing you could do, and I had Ron Friends draw Captain America in the Captain uh, design, which I just love, and uh, also this is one of the earliest same around the same time period. One of the earliest commissions I got was from Bob Layton, who's you know one of the most well known Iron Man artists, I guess, probably ever. Probably drew about as many Iron Man comics as anybody, and I asked for, of course, the Silver Centurion armor. Yeah, you know, and and Bob was such a uh, so good at inking Iron Man's armor that even the John Romita Jr. issues that Bob inked or, or or did inks on covers, you almost think of them as Bob Layton art because they have his touch to them. Spoiler alert for the comic itself: the confrontation only lasts about one page. <laughs> and I won't tell you how it turns out. <laughs> Iron Man 228. <laughs> All righty. Well, I'm taking over next and I'm going to switch gears. And, uh, you know, before I go into this, let's check. Uh, I'm going back to 1980 with my favorite oh, Marvel Fun and Games magazine. Oh, I love it so much. And uh, this was a series that Marvel did. Uh, where it was just made up of puzzles and some posters. And now this one I picked because, obviously, of Cross Wordo. Uh, Because Cross Wordo is, well, I have to tell you, he's the meanest menace in comics, Cross Wordo. And uh, so you think about the the history of comics, going all the way back to uh, Red Skull, you got Thanos... You know, you got Kang. But no, no, no. Cross Wordo is the meanest menace in comics. Uh, this series was fantastic, and it was brought to us by Owen McCarran. And Owen McCarran, and the reason, Shane, I thought you might like to talk about Owen, Owen was primarily known for uh, doing coloring books and kind of the stuff that we kind of do instead of comics, even though I think he he was friends with Stan Lee, and I think he would pitch in on stuff every now and then to help, but he was a Canadian artist. I mean, you know, you could do amazing, Doramu, I've come to bargain, and do a, you know, (laughs) maze through your head. Ah, come on, you had the thing's favorite TV show was the Rockford Files. Wait, wait, here's the where's my laughing button? Come on. Uh, and then Owen would do a poster in it, and and you know a lot of sometimes he would ape a, a old style guide or, or existing art that he would kind of redo. But I mean, nothing says the, the time period than a a, a word puzzle with the uh, hypno hustlers disco dozen. This comic book is uh, is a gem. The whole series is a gem. Uh, Owen originally started doing the the Marvel Superheroes fun book in the 70s. That was kind of almost more for adults or a little bit more elaborate. And his art was all black and white line art and a little bit more scratchy line art. 
Uh, again, sometimes it was redoing existing art, but Owen would also do, he, he did coloring books for Shogun Warriors. He would do the painted covers. He'd do the interiors. My absolute favorite coloring book, so I'm kind of double dipping here, but his, I think his is just his absolute piece de resistance was the Fantastic Four Meet the Witch. And this is my favorite coloring book. Uh, it was brought to us by Whitman from 1977. And this was the Fantastic Four that meet a witch. You know, look, it's a witch. God bless them. Uh, <laughs> The witch, the witch, you know, the witch is a witch. So the witch uh, turns. The, the thing on that previous image, the thing was asking the question that I think all of us. <laughs> <laughs> you're sure you're in the right coloring book, Torch? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there you go. And uh, so, and you think, you think, you know, you really think, you know, like you could write this, this book and think, yeah, I mean, they're just going to they're just going to fight a witch and, you know, they'll get better and the will defeat the witch. But no, uh, at some point, <laughs> you know, she starts telling about how she used to be beautiful and the thing, and the thing falls in love with her, which is a little weird. But then she kind of goes into her life story about being from like outer space. And, you know, there's a space creature involved. Now I don't did you see the space creature? Did you did you have that pegged as part of a plot point? I didn't see that coming. So then somehow it turns into buzzards, and then it turns out that the witch is actually a, a, a giant buzzard, and then it turns out that the witch is actually a, a giant married buzzard, and her husband's name is Tyrone. The end. The thing is, the thing is upset. He kissed a married woman, not a buzzard. <laughs> <laughs> I did ends, not see that coming. It ends with just this color. Like, hey, kids, color the page of the Fantastic Four, just waving and Reed saying goodbye, goodbye. And uh, that thing has got. That's the most unpleasant arm position on the thing I've ever seen in my life. God oh. bless you, Owen. Oh man. Oh. That was, I tell you, that was something. I tell you, I love his work so much. Uh, it's just, I don't know how fast he was going with these, but they're just so bananas crazy that uh, that that I I just love his stuff. And uh, so, just to wrap this up because we're over time here. Every now and then we do a segment. What the did Dave buy now? Let's just uh, this kind of ties in. So let's see here. As we're chatting, Shane, thanks so much for joining us, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm sorry that you ended up on this show, but uh, you know, <laughs> we do what we can. Let's see what we got in the box here from Amazon this week. So. Uh, this is this is the Marvel Big Book of Fun and Games, and this is just put out by Abrams. The cover, I don't mean to be rude about an artist's work. It's not their fault, but I don't understand why they do the modern cover. But uh, this is a fantastic, and I'm just seeing this for the first time, a nice uh, color reproduction of all the uh, covers and uh, a lot of the artwork from the uh, from the series that you can actually get now in a nice kind of uh, a book. And uh, oh, okay, here we go. Now I'm back. Oh, oh, look at that! Interesting. Ooh, <laughs> beam yard. But. Uh, yeah, you know, so this is on a nicer paper. You don't have to go hunting down the old uh, the old books. It does not have everything, so you're not going to find the Hypno Hustler here in all his disco magic, and you're not going to find Cross Wordo, unfortunately, which uh, I have to say I understand, but I'm a bit let down. Um, so it is it is kind of a selection of the more familiar pages from the series 
But uh, I picked this up. I think it was about 12 bucks off of Amazon. And, uh, you know, if you can't hunt down the original issues, that's, that's a pretty good thing. That's pretty cool that Abrams actually uh, did a little bit to bring back Owen McCarran. Um, let's just see, though. Sometimes they get me. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're a little quicker to promote the introduction by Roe Thomas than they are anything that Owen did. And as artists, uh, that kind of pisses us off, right, Shane? I mean, the color cover says introduction by Roy Thomas. Doesn't say anything about Owen's contribution to everything. You know, what's funny is you you held up that um, Ahsoka book, and it's a picture book, and they put the writer's name on there, and she's the voice of Ahsoka in the Clone Wars, but it's a picture book. By definition, it wouldn't exist without the pictures. Mm -hmm. And there's room on the other side. There's a big blank space on the other side. They could have put me on there. Yeah. So, so with this one, the cover, Roy Thomas. Whole intro page, Roy Thomas. Um, Owen is briefly mentioned in the uh, small little blurb here. Uh, and then... Uh, and then I think Roy thankfully writes about Owen. So thank, you know, thank God for that. At least, at least they brought Roy in to at least talk about Owen's you know work. What, what helps me sleep is that they get paid significantly less. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who gets paid? <laughs> <laughs> the writers significant, get paid significantly less. And so they have oh. to, uh, you know, sell issues or. You know, they get the praise, but you can't eat praise, so. Well, and, and it is kind of rough. And actually, that's been one of the newest things that's been very frustrating with um, when the pandemic hit. You know, sometimes we like to look up our release dates and we like to use Amazon searches and Google searches for kind of seeing, telling people our body of work. And uh, Random House, sadly either due to pandemic or whatever, the writer gets confirmed first. And then the artist often <laughs> confirmed later. And so when the specifics of the either the ISBN number or the title goes promoted online to Amazon, to uh, Random House's website, the writer's name is attached and we aren't yet. Right. Right. And off and and then what ended up happening over the pandemic was they stopped updating it. I thought about changing my name legally to either Golden Books or TDK. One of the other <laughs> I actually filed with when I did a an a writer's page or a creator's author's page on Amazon, I actually filed to be known as Random House and they, they it went through. <laughs> Was it TBK? I don't. I never even know what it means. Well, I actually got. I actually got approved to be known as Random House. <laughs> nice. But yeah, and then and then of course, what ends up being uh, from Amazon's standpoint, which has nothing to do with the publishers, Amazon loves to insult us by putting the artist's name and then putting and one other. Right, the writer, the writer, and then one yeah, they other. put the writer's name. Yeah. And then they put one other, and you have to click on that right. for our name to show up, which now it doesn't because, sadly, something's gone on with staffing or whatever in the chain of command somewhere where they're not updating things. And so, you know, we still get paid. Hopefully the name's still on the book, but it was like if you're used to using these things as kind of a way of finding out information, Oh, yeah, and I still meet people that think like, oh, you're going to be a famous artist or they see that I did the Avengers and you think, well, that's a, a zillion dollar franchise. You must be rich. And I'm just like, well, I did the one book for X amount, man. Like, you know, it's just like a job, like any other job, only you're putting pictures on the paper. Yep. Oh, and it's and I tell you, you know, uh, it's it's been a blast. I I've enjoyed the twenty years of it so far. Um, so I'm I'm more than happy to keep going for as long as they need me, and uh, hopefully that I'll keep going. I feel you're probably the same way. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, one day I want to like sit out on the beach and just like never draw again. I think, like you know, I you actually know, after Thanos snapped everybody and he was sitting out there just like content. Like I want to get to that point and then just never draw again. But <laughs> I g- I gave myself a little taste of that over the summer, for the first time in a long time, that uh, things finished up and uh, and I didn't really go hunting too desperately for more. And uh, so even right now, I mean, right now I'm, I'm still kind of taking the summer easy and, uh, you know, and yeah, I mean, that's not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I still unfortunately have bills to pay, but, you know. Right. That's why when the kids are grown and I don't have those bills or whatever, then maybe. But let's bring them back on. This is the kid I have to pay for. Hey, Adam. Yeah. Hey, uh, I can't retire because of you. Oh, yeah. Hey, thanks cool. a lot. Thanks. Yeah. For, hey, are you gonna yeah. go? Hey, are you spending uh, your money on murder bots. <laughs> are you thinking about going to college? Uh, yeah. Ah. Uh, all right. Well. Oh, thanks a lot, Adam. Bye. Uh so I guess I have I guess I have at least eight more years I have to keep doing this. And they keep coming up with new and fun things that I want to do. Like I miss, I imagine like one day like Marvel will disappear and then it'll come back. You know, and then I'll be like, Oh, I already did that. You know what I mean? But like there's always like fun things and like new things coming up that I want to do. And I've just been lucky that I've gotten the jobs that I have gotten. But See, I think one day I won't be around. That's the difference with with you and me is that with Nickelodeon and doing the licensing stuff, I, I, you know, SpongeBob kind of never left. Uh, I, it might be, it might be done now. I don't know. One book I did last year got bumped to later this year for the release date, but uh, Dora is coming back, and so you know, Dora was like, I was Dora, dude. So. I sincerely hope that the email from Nick comes in and they don't forget Dora Dave Dora. <laughs> uh, because I am it's coming back like as a reboot or like back into the, the zeitgeist. Oh no, it's, it's, it's getting the, uh, it's getting the current uh, 3d, you know, I say 3d it's getting the current CGI house yeah. style makeover. I didn't know that. Which um, quite honestly, at least for Blue's Clues, the CGI Blue is adorable. Mm-hmm. I think it's fantastic. I look back, because I wasn't a Blue's Clues generation, I look back at the original Blue, and I find it terrifying. Uh, and this new one I find to be just incredibly adorable. So there is a chance that the the new CGI Dora could be absolutely fantastic in terms of animation and character. Because I've seen a little bit of the character design work, and it's Dora, just CGI. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, hey, <laughs> I'm here, guys. I, I got my stylist. I'm ready you gotta, to go. You got to reach out to him, man. You always have Oh, to no, I out. do. James, you know, uh, James, they, you know, every time they're like, we'll let you know, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Sometimes I'll reach out to people and they'll just be like, oh, we didn't know you were into that. And it's like, man, I'm. <laughs> well, the interesting thing with um, with so so when SpongeBob and this is what I, I I'm I'm unsure of because they kind of threw me for a little loop, a pleasant loop surprise with with Camp Coral, in that uh, they they redesigned SpongeBob for the movie. They they did the story of him as a little kid. And then they did Camp Coral, where he's a little bit older and still a kid, and it's all CGI. I never had to do any sort of new test to to become a Camp Coral artist. Uh. Because the book art was still the SpongeBob book art style. And so, and there weren't that many to be done. So literally, they just said uh, to, to my buddy Shane, my other buddy Shane, my Random House uh, designer Shane, that I enjoy working with, they said uh, Shane just was like, "Yeah, I got these books, and you know, you're my guy." And so, you know, 
it, there was nothing to it. There was no, it was just, there you go. And so I'm curious with, with the revamp Dora, if the book style is going to be the old kind of familiar style that I already do, mm. then there's no, like then there's really no hearing from Nick. There's no of uh, James, you know, emailing me. It's literally just somebody one day, be it, you know, one of the people I know from Random House or somebody new saying, hey, it's Dora time. <laughs> Stop, Dora time. Mm. And, and we get to work. So don't know, you know, don't know if I'll be like basically grandfathered in or, uh, or if it'll be, uh, you know, what, what it'll be. So, yeah. That's interesting. I haven't even seen those things, so I'm, I'm going to keep an eye out for them. Oh, Sometimes they, they get Shane's emails. Sometimes they send them to me, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to I'm not gonna edit that book. What are you talking about? Or something. <laughs> oh, you get, you get Shane. The, <laughs> the wrong Shane. Yeah. Shane is lucky that uh, he is out. He is out on the coast, so he's uh, he, he's kind of uh, an off-site. Well, everybody's off-site, but he was like the, the OG off-site designer. And, Wait, uh, he's on which coast? He's on he's on the west. west. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Which is great because you know my messed up sleep clock. So uh, yeah. So, but yeah, no, and 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 the same with everyone that that we've worked with at Random House. Just an absolute pleasure uh, to work with. And honestly, I found I don't know about you. I've never had to work with Disney, um, but like working with John Cena Corporation and and a lot of other companies, uh, even those the licensors and Nickelodeon. Uh, not kissing up, but man, everybody's been lovely. So, yeah, if they haven't been, I'm not going to say. So, yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, there might be old ones. I tell you, the one we like to talk about is Lazy Town, but that was so long ago. And Lazy even Town. even Nick admitted that that was a that was just oh, oh, oh man, <laughs> that's well, it. The hardest thing I don't know about like the licensor was bad, but the hardest part. I had once with working with licensor was the Grinch when I was trying to draw a book and they had no movie and they had no screenshots to send me. They had no designs. And so I was turning stuff in as they were making a movie and then they were putting it together that it's wrong. And I was like, yeah, man, like that was a challenge. So the worst from what I understand, and I have seen, I think the book to back up the story, but, uh, when I started working on uh, the second SpongeBob movie books, my designer at the time had said, oh, if you think this is bad, the first movie, we had no ending. And the book just had to end. Oh, wow. And sure enough, there are, there are the eight by eight books where they're just parts of the story and SpongeBob and Patrick just at the end of the first chunk drive off into the sunset for the next part, or there's just no end yeah. to, to the book. But I've done enough movie projects or event tentpole books that aren't done yet to uh, to know basically to know the score. And you know, working with Shane and SpongeBob movie books, we know and. All we have to do is just say up front, once the color art is done, if you need me to make a drastic change because the reference is in, it's just going to cost money. You know, don't expect that to be, oh, wait, we finally got it, Dave. You know, if you, if you, if you start pulling that baloney, there's a certain point. Where you, where, where we're committed, you know, and if somebody says, "Oh, we've got the final character design," I'll change it, but you know, it, it, it's going to require a, a different budget. But that's movie books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then you, you know, but then you get to say, like, "Hey, I worked on that movie," you know. So. Well, the, the, the last one I did, the, the, the pandemic, the, what was hysterical about the last one we did, which was for the, fi the, the previous SpongeBob movie, was we went through the whole normal movie process where we don't know what stuff looks like, we're doing our best, 
working from, you know, maybe, you know, uh, uh, design art and stuff. Uh, we got it done, you know, good enough. Everything's fine. And then uh, the books were to come out early before the movie. So the books came out in March of 2020. And then the movie did not come out. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the movie never came out to the theaters and was eventually in America released on Paramount Plus in I think January or February of 2021. Yeah. So the book sat there on the shelves for almost a year. And it was like, oh, so glad we, uh, so glad we, we hustled. <laughs> yeah, that happened with tons of things. Where like, like the Minions Two just came out, and uh, there was all that product sitting on shelves two years ago, or whatever. Yeah, and, and and you know, I mean, and it happened. You know, Chips came out for with you know Wonder Woman eighty four or Mysterio, you know, or whatever. You know, it just messed with everything because, hey, it's 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 on a it's on a boat. Product is right. product. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the, uh, that's the way it goes, but well, thank you, sir. It's been a little extra longer, uh, Dave and Joe are bored because we got Shane on. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I don't get to talk shop a lot with people. Like most of the time, like the learning curve is just so drastic, I think. Right. With like other people and jobs and then, and it's just this interesting if it's not your day in and day out. And nobody wants to hear your struggles about drawing children's books. <laughs> like basically, it's not. Well, I tell, like, I tell, and that's one of the reasons why I haven't had any of my comic art buddies on yet because uh, you know I really wanted to get artists that were uh, more um, that that just weren't comics. You know, comic stuff because I figure like a lot of people talk to comic book artists on on you know either podcasts or whatnot, and we tend to get you know we illustrators or commercial artists or children's book artists or pixel artists or just you know uh, or even John with the writing you know it, it's not something that uh, that that you know people talk about and and you know I don't know if any art students are ever going to stumble upon any of this stuff, which is a shame if they don't. But uh, because there's just not a lot of, of discussion about it out there because it's either it's either really nerdy genre stuff mm -hmm. or or it's comics. We kind of get kind of, you know, in a weird little. Uh, hush, hush, mysterious world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. And that's why they struggle finding people to do the license stuff, because you're like, well, I can draw and I like this property. I should be able to work on this book. And then it's the zero information out there for what that process is actually going to be like. There is. And, and schools don't teach it. Uh, they want, they, they, now there are degrees, art schools. And I went to art school here in Columbus and now they actually have a degree for comic art for being, you know, for comic books, which is the most hysterical thing that you're going to pay 130 grand to have a degree in comics. Um, but they, but nobody is, is set up to teach, especially on model licensing. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just not taught and I'm not sure how they would. I mean, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go teach that, you know, for, for the pittance that a lot of art schools pay for their faculty. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know. It's a lot of how do you get the work and, and your stuff is a little more off model, which which allows you a little more leeway, but not always. You know, you did some stuff with Nick and where it still had to be yeah. pretty and the Sesame Street people will yeah. draw right over my work nonstop. But well that's the blue what line. I, what I do well, is that it's, I think my work is misleading because it's on model and then I put off model stuff on top of it. So yeah. if you took out, you know, the texturing and stuff and just rendered it with line art and airbrushing, it would look like any other book nine times out of 10. Well, definitely the Sesame Street stuff, uh, especially is kind of your, in a while, that's the first time I've seen you do um, pretty, pretty much traditional licensing, yeah. 
work, but with your your little bit of shameness, which is pretty cool. Like like they didn't say to you, "Hey, match this," which is what they do to me, which I don't mind because I kind of enjoy being a mimic. I would assume that you got to be involved and in, or did did Random House pitch you as a package to uh to the Sesame Street people? Yeah, yeah, so they they pitched me and then I came up with that style based on things that they had already done. So I also pitched the style to what I thought Sesame would like. Yeah, for that. And it's kind of fun <clears throat> to be a part of that because you're kind of I mean, I don't want to say you're digging your own grave, but there's a certain point when you're doing some uh, some kind of development work where you're like, now remember, you're going to have to do books of this. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to know when to stop because if you start throwing in too many bells and whistles, you only have yourself to blame. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot of effort I put into, like, my father used to give me a hard time when I was a kid because I worked so hard at being lazy, and now it's paying off. Like a lot of the style, I, I'm like, can I do this quickly and consistently, you know? And, it's and extremely important. It is extremely important to to understand that you're going to have, like when you're doing one piece of understanding that you're going to have to do this over and over again, this technique. And so the sky is not the limit. Right. You have to keep an eye on the clock. And sometimes when Nickelodeon comes up with stuff, that is my challenge. Shimmer and Shine was the perfect example of that. It was, we have done everything with bells and whistles, an insane amount of bells and whistles. Can you, can you do this? And, you know, it was my job to say, I think I can. I think I can. And I did. And then, the, and then I kept getting emails uh, for the first time ever from Random House saying, we need help uh, because uh, some other people maybe underestimated it mm -hmm. that were newer and, and not used to this and didn't get that, that this thing's a monster. Of That's what I think when I look at your um, Rusty, like that book in particular, those, the, right? The Elbow Grease or Rusty, uh, Rusty Rivets? Or Rusty, Rusty Rivets, right? You did the, the Gorilla book. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like that seems like a labor intensive work to me. That style that you work in. Well, that that's that's why I like using the freehand 5 for the line work because I'm quick at it. But but when you do that from the very start, you try to see if you can reuse and 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 say okay, well maybe that head, you know, will right. show up again here. And that's what when you told me that, I was like, "Oh, that's how you're able to uh... And you were telling me how you have like whole vehicles and a file that you can cut and paste. And like, that's how that, yeah. Which, could, and, there's no way I could keep that up book after book. No, but you have to, you have to approach that efficiency uh, uh, attitude um, from the, the get go of the roughs. Mm -hmm. Like, like that is that is the goal of the roughs is to create your 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 game plan and to figure out your efficiency and see what you can kind of get away with almost like because you know if you don't do this you're going to be in trouble mm -hmm. you know uh, you're you're going to you're going to see your your hourly rate or your weekly paycheck take a huge dive and uh, so you have to kind of say, OK, well, you know, that and this and this and that. And, and maybe this is here and this is here. And I mean, I like to sometimes I, there was a, the first Shimmer and Shine book. Their hair was so bizarre and, and, oh, and done. And I was like, I don't know if I can figure out how they illustrated their hair. So I'm just going to have to work with the style guide art. And one of the characters they only had she wasn't she was asymmetrical with her head and they had only given me one head uh, turning this way. Yeah. And, and I don't, didn't know what this head, she had like a star or something. And I didn't, I would have had to recreate it. So there's an entire book where that character is looking this way for the entire book. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was like, can I, can I do this? And, and, and I kind of roughed it all out and, and it was like, nobody said anything. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's not <laughs> 
kind of like then, jazz where you have to be flexible to what you're given your compositions you have to be able to compose things yeah you know so freely in that if you only have this image that's going to dictate your whole page and it has well, to work for the story exactly and i figured it out and then the next book i had more time because there was so much to do on that first book that like the next book i had more time to sit down and say okay you know enough's enough <laughs> we have to we have to get her her other head in here and uh, and do that and that's the benefit of multiple jobs uh, of of the same license is that you you do that first you spend all the time and then the next one hopefully you know you build up on some of the old art you you used you add new you know and and you kind of improve and you snowball and then the third one and, and if a show never never really gets gets instantly killed really quickly you don't get to the spoils of your backlog of of work to fall back on um, which you don't tend to have to you know you don't tend to get to do that you know you get yeah, different I have like, to relearn every time yeah. yep so that is that's kind of the payoff where you where you look at something you go wow that looks like it would take forever and it's like yeah it, it can but then you you try to you know book number two you use a little here and there and book number three and that's kind of when the payoff kicks in yeah but well man this is the longest Dave and Joe are bored we've ever done <laughs> sorry <laughs> Joe is falling asleep but. Uh, Thank you so much. I guess it's time. Oh, it's time. Bluto always tell us goodbye forever. And we still uh, we still come back. Shane, thanks again. Hopefully yeah, we'll, thank see you. Good to you we'll, we'll see if we can get in touch with Alan. Maybe we can get him on the show at a different hour. <laughs> but thanks again, buddy. It's been a pleasure to finally get to chat with you, at least through this uh, world of of thing shane you're on instagram uh what do you uh what's your little instagram handle i think it's shane scribbles shane scribbles and uh we get to see your love of minecraft uh, of not minecraft your love of fortnite <laughs> and playmobil i just like to win <laughs> <laughs> I had okay. This is, this show is off the rails. We'll just keep. I had a, a friend of mine's uh, son. I was hanging with today at a comic convention, as I was selling, trying to get rid of some books. And he was playing uh, 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 Roblox. And he looked up and he said, "What if? What if the people who have accounts that you're playing against are actually ghosts, and you don't know it?" And I was like. So like you could be playing Minecraft, you could be playing Fortnite against George Washington's ghost. Whoa. It's like it's like in Minecraft, your fort could be ruined by the ghost of Fatty Arbuckle. Whoa. <laughs> so you keep that in mind. If you get sniped in Fortnite, it could be the Andrew sisters. Yeah. That'd be better than the six-year-old that's probably actually killing me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Hey, my best to you and the family. Yeah, thanks, man. You too. Nice to meet you, Shane. You too, Keep Joe. up the thanks. fantastic work, man. The books are Thank fantastic. Thank you. I will as long as they'll keep me. What's coming out, uh, just just uh, if you can, what, what, what's, uh, what do we look for on the shelves? New Elmo, uh, new uh, Sesame Street Thanksgiving book. Yeah, yeah. The, the other Sesame Street... The Spanish is my superpower is coming out next week, I think. And then a month after that is the Thanksgiving. I got a couple more Sesame coming out after that. I got the Marvels coming out. Oh, yeah, that one. That looked cool. Yeah, it's pretty fun. That's a pretty good gig. I have. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to brag, but I have uh, Happy Birthday Elbow Grease. The little golden book comes out in October. Oh. I think that's the last one. I think I'm surprised I think you I'm didn't change the style for that. I saw the but, cover. I saw the cover, and I was surprised you didn't change the style for the gold. Oh God, no! No, I wouldn't have done <laughs> it. Wouldn't have done it. Nope. That was that oh. was my main. That was my. Uh, I had to because because the style, the art is so detailed that if I can't dip into previous uh, uh, oh, files, I can't yeah. do it. It's just yeah. too. It's too elaborate. So 
No, they said, nope, keep it the same. And I was like, yeah, everything broke. I just thought maybe you would want to take the opportunity to do, you know, something different with the, the LGB style. Only, only way I would have is if it could have been uh, really graphic simplified, mm -hmm. which would have, which could have looked fantastic. Yeah, um, but nobody even, nobody even asked. So, mm. and you, know. you didn't want to bring it up. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I will say that the, the John Cena group, um, yeah, I think I don't know if I did about eight or nine books. I forget. Um, could not have been a, a lovelier uh, a licensor to, to, I mean, their approval. Again, roughs to finished art and the amount of revisions was zero to, you know, to minimal and just like perf. You couldn't have asked for better. So I, uh, if everybody like guy himself, he's well, actually, he might be in the Fortnite shop right now. If you log in right now, you might be able to play as your boss. <laughs> And I just want to say, and, and you're going to be really, really jealous because I don't think you can top me on this. In the 20 years of working on these books and the 200 books or so, uh, I have only seen one of my writers uh, almost naked or naked or in their <laughs> underwear. And that has been John Cena. So, I mean, I'm not asking to see any of my other writers. I'm just saying it was a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> like normally I don't even see who my writers are, but right, yeah. watching, sitting there watching TV going, that's, that's, that's my writer. I work for that guy. Yeah. He's naked. <laughs> I will say just recently, one of the writers that wrote a book that I did was posting some, posting some uh, thirst traps. Like, <laughs> so. It wasn't. It wasn't that different from what Cena wrestles in. <laughs> so. Oh man, I, it's it's weird when they do the celebrity books. But man, I tell you, I missed out on on the Shakira Dora book. I did a sample, and it was before I think I'd updated my Photoshop, and the sample was garbage, and I didn't yeah. get the job. And so I that was my first. I thought, oh man, I could have done a a celebrity book. And uh, so it was kind of fun when uh, Random House asked me to to do the kind of the simplified version of the Elbow Grace books to just do a, a celebrity series. You know, check it off the list. Yeah. All right, Daddy O. All right, man. We'll Can't see you later, buddy. Man. <laughs> Bye, Shane. Take care. <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna talk. I'm tired, and I'm in a talkative mood. Hey, Adam. Hi. All right. Good night, Adam. Good night. I think this is a good way to uh, to end. Uh, maybe take a little break, or we'll see when Dave and Joe are bored. Comes back, and uh, you know. Yeah. Stay tuned to Facebook for some updates on that. I guess. But we did have fun today. We were out in Dayton at the Jim and Dan uh, convention. I was uh, trying to load some books, and you were uh, picking up. Uh, oh. Look at that! That was some of the uh, mm. that's some of the '80s goodness that I was uh, trying to unload there. Smells amazing. Oh, thank man! I tell. Oh man, when I first got and opened up all the boxes, the whole dining room smelled like uh, like '80s comics heaven. Yeah, I uh, I, I recently uh, I recently reorganized some of my comics and put them in a closet that I wasn't really using. By the way, hey Dan. There's Dan, and. Uh, now I just like to open up that closet every once in a while and just smell it. Yeah. Reminds me of the comic store I went to when I was a kid. Yeah. That's why I like having the spinner racks uh, and, and just, uh, you know, making them, hearing them squeak. It's fun. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So a uh, long day of, uh, of, of comics. And uh, next weekend I'm going to be up in uh, Livonia, Michigan at the Knights of Columbus there and Farmington Road and Seven Mile with the, uh, with more comics to try to unload. And then uh, what's, what's the name of that show? It is. I think it's like the Knights of Columbus uh, comics. I, I don't know, man. Who know? It's my buddy Bill and Jesse's show. And I think it's just like a Knights, Knights of Columbus or something. Yeah. I don't know. But that's Sunday from like 10 till four selling comics. 
and then uh, or trying to get rid of them. And then uh, September, we got Monroe, Michigan, uh, pop culture, whatever. I got, I got a comic show there, and then uh, Cincinnati Comic Expo, and then Motor City Comic Con in October. Yep, I should be at the busy. Cincinnati show at least. Oh, that'll be fun. That's going to have a, the reunion of a Batman animated series cast. And Paul Williams, who is the voice of the Penguin, but forget that, Paul Williams, not only Little Enos and Smokey and the Bandit, but uh, but also the writer, co-writer of Rainbow Connection, all of the Muppet movie soundtrack songs, and uh, some of my favorite songs from the Carpenters. So that's going to be that's going to be a good time. And Kevin Conroy, God, oh man, I could go. Adrian Barbeau, oh, it's going to be a great time. So there. All right. Sneak pre sneak peek preview of the Cincinnati Expo. All right, daddy -o. Well, I think that's Scott. So uh, we're closing in at a minute, uh, hour 45. That's yeah. way past the bedtime. Yeah, we've, yeah, we're way over. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, we got our Dave and Joe, our board channel. So, uh, you know, you want to watch it later, subscribe to that bad boy. Check it out, and uh, we'll be back uh, later in August at some point. We'll figure it out. All right. Good night, Joe. Good night. <laughs> we'll see you later, buddy. Thanks. See ya. Oh, let's. Oh, it's oh. terrifying. It's just terrifying. <laughs> oh, no. No one's going to be able to sleep now.